This is Supported Sexy, episode 152, with actor, writer, producer, director, podcast host, and so much more, Reagan Gomez. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm thrilled to have you here because it just would not be the same without you. And today I'm excited about our guest, Reagan Gomez. As you can hear from that intro, she is a multi-hyphenate, a proud multi-hyphenate. What I love about Reagan, there are many things, but what I really love is that she does not ask for permission to create the kind of content that she wants to see and that she wants to deliver to her audience. She is a voice for women. She is a voice voice for women of color, and she creates stories that really reflect a lot of different experiences, different perspectives. I really love the work that she has done and continues to do. She is an actress who has been working for 20 years, which is so rare in Hollywood. She has a family, which, well, I can't say that's so rare in Hollywood, but we rarely see that in Hollywood, right? That's not the image that people portray in Hollywood. So Reagan really is a unique story, and I just love what she has to say about One, about the things that she's creating, but also about politics. She's been very active in the political space. She was a surrogate for President Obama years ago. And she also talks about this new environment and culture that we're in, but also what she's teaching her young daughter about how to be as a young woman, how to embrace this idea of resistance, how to stand up for yourself. So I really love the conversation that we had around that because a lot of people are thinking about what they're telling their children about the climate that we're in right now. So Reagan and I talk a little bit about that. But what I think is really a powerful thread throughout Reagan's story is this idea of not asking for permission to do the things that you want to do, to voice your opinion, to use your voice and your platform in order to make change in the world. So on this episode, what you'll learn from her is the importance of teaching our girls to be confident and vocal, how to give our girls space to express themselves, also her advice to her younger self as an actress, how to survive the Hollywood machine. As we mentioned, she's been in the business for 20 years, so she has a lot of experience and a bit of perspective on it. Why creating your own content is crucial. Why she feels it's so important for black and marginalized women, especially to create content. How to utilize social media to support your content and to connect. How to build your tribe. And we talk about how important it is to have a tribe. You know, we're all about that. Support is sexy. So Reagan talks about the importance of having her tribe and how she built that. Also, how to trust your gut and why it's okay to still be finding your way in the space of self-care. All of us talk about self-care a lot or hear about it a lot, but a lot of us are still finding our way and what that means to us. And I appreciate Reagan. Thank you, Reagan, for being honest about her journey in self-care. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Reagan mentions a lot of resources in this episode. So make sure you go to supportissexypodcast.com so you can see all of the resources and the links that will have there waiting for you. All right. So without further ado, Reagan Gomez. So Reagan, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Elaine. Of course. Now, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Um, I feel like, I think my story is somewhat special. Um, being that the first job, I'm an actress first, and the first job that I got when I moved out here was on the Parenthood. And watching uh, Robert Townsend, who was obviously the star of the show, but he was so much more than that. Uh, he was also the producer. He directed a lot of episodes. He wrote a few. Um, and being on the show from you know 14 years old up until the show ended, I think at 18 or 19, and watching him, the older I got, the more I realized that seeing him in that position kind of planted seeds in me that I didn't even know were there. Mm-hmm. So 
going from audition to audition, growing from, you know, a teenager to a young woman and, and being a black woman in the business, um, and auditioning and seeing the lack of roles that were not available to actresses who look like me, um, I uh, knew that I wanted to start creating those roles. So watching Robert and all that, that that's where the seeds were planted in me to want to write, to want to uh, create more opportunities for not only actors and actresses, but just people of color in the business period, whether it's in front of the camera, behind the camera or whatever. So I think it's been a journey for me. There was never one, I guess, day where I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to, you know, be an entrepreneur and create my own, you know, uh, content and hire more people and all that and do it on my own and raise money. It was never a one day thing. It was kind of steps Mm -hmm. steps you know that got me closer and closer to to being able to realize this dream and I'm still you know hustling and struggling trying to figure out how I'm gonna you know fund my next project but it's it's definitely been a journey and a journey that I'm um, excited about yeah now you were born and raised in Detroit right yes I was and then you moved to LA when you were how old um, well, after Detroit, we moved to Philly, and um, Philly is actually where I started uh, acting. Okay, I went back and forth. We were in Philly for about about eight years, and um, I started a theater program in Philly, and then I started going back and forth to New York, doing independent stuff in New York. And it was uh, one summer, the summer I, after I graduated eighth grade, that my mom was like, "Let's just go to LA and see what happens." And we took the Greyhound bus from Philly to LA. She knew somebody who lived in Inglewood. So we stayed there. And within two months, I had a manager. I had booked um, a Disney movie, a remake of Freaky Friday with um, Shelley Long and Gabby Hoffman. Shelley Long used to be on the show called Cheers. Yes. I don't know how old your, your yes, listeners are. I remember. But, I sort of yes. remember. I think I was a little baby then. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and then I wound up booking the parenthood and then we had to move out to LA. Wow. So that so was 94. Yeah, that was 94. And you were how old yep. at that time? 14. I was 14. Yeah. So a couple of things. One, what were you like as a little girl even before you started acting? I was very precocious. It's funny because I look at my daughter who's nine and she reminds me so much of myself. Very precocious, very talkative, questions, everything very fun. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a bit more carefree, I think, than I than I was which I really adore about her. Um, Why were you carefree? I, was, I don't know. And I don't know if may, maybe, maybe I was, but now that, you know, I'm on Twitter and social media, not a lot in the whole black girl magic, carefree, carefree black people and all that kind of stuff. I see it in her. Maybe I was, and I just didn't know it at the time, but mm-hmm. she's very carefree. She's very not afraid to be herself and not afraid to be silly and goofy. Um, I want to say I was like that, too, (laughs) but I think she is that times 10. And um, I think we I see myself in her a lot. So I'd like to say I was I was like her. (laughs) I was like her. Were you always drawn to acting even before you started? Because for your mom to know at with you being at such a young age, you know what, we're moving to uh, L.A. We're taking the Greyhound from Philly yeah. to L.A. to make this happen. Was it? Something? No, it wasn't. It wasn't oh. that it wasn't like that at all. What happened was so uh, after we left Detroit, we moved to Arkansas. My dad was uh, just graduated from uh, medical school and his residency and all that. So we moved around for a bit. We moved from Detroit to Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas, stayed there for a year. Then we moved to Philly and we settled in Philly. Um, and this first school that I went to. I was the only black girl, only black person. There was actually one other black girl um, in the whole grade. Mm. And I was very, I just, I wasn't confident in myself. I was nine. I had already started my menstrual. I was taller than everybody. I was developed. I wore glasses. It just wasn't, you know, that awkward stage. I was, I was in that awkward stage and Mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling good about myself at all. So that's when my mom was like, "Uh uh-uh, we're going to this black theater program. You know, you're going to be around a lot of black kids that look like you. And I just blossomed there. We sang, we danced, we did everything there and I just blossomed. And that's how it started for me. And that's how it started. Did you feel like when you blossomed, did you also feel like you fell in love with the art at that time? 
I did. I remember my first production that we did because we did plays. We performed everywhere. When the audience stood up and clapped, I was like, you know what? This is what I want to do. This is This it. is exactly what I want to do. Yep. And did you communicate that to your mom at that time? Or do you think she sort of saw it in you as well? I think she saw it in me because I was there at the theater program for a few years. And immediately we got an agent. We started going back and forth to New York. And she saw it because everything about me changed. And I think in addition to being in that theater program, this was the early 90s. uh, Hip hop was really starting to bubble like Mm -hmm. mainstream. Like I had TLC. I had, you know, Crisscross. I had the Brad. I had ABC. So along with me and other black kids kind of discovering ourselves, we had this culture that was bubbling up that we could be like, yeah, this is ours. And I remember going back to like my all white school and everybody, me letting everybody know like, this is the new song, this is what's hot or whatever. And they were starting to find out because MTV was a thing too. So mm-hmm. that kind of, I think, helped my confidence and my self-esteem as well. Do you think as a mom, this is something that you try to pay attention to in your daughter, just things that she's drawn to naturally that might be something that blossom into something later? I do. Um, She plays club soccer. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I put her in club soccer is because I saw that kind of awkward stage coming. She was a bit younger than I was, um, but I There is something about putting girls in sports. I was in sports as well that teaches them leadership and teaches them, yeah, okay, society may tell you to sit down with your legs crossed or whatever, but when you out on that field, you better bust some heads. You better Mm -hmm. do what you need to (laughs) do to get that goal or whatever. And it's you need that because you take those lessons off of the field with you and you apply them wherever you are, whether it's, you know, you want to get an A on this report or whatever you want this this role in this play or whatever you take that uh, whatever that uh, is that you need on the field and you apply it everywhere so I, I I did do that with her now she's a little different than me she doesn't really care about music mm-hmm. I took her to a Beyonce concert last year for her birthday and she was kind of like mom who are these people I don't know who any <laughs> of these people are I but then of it. course and she's not even really a big Beyonce fan she doesn't really listen to a lot of music e- anyway me and my husband are kind of the hip-hop heads in mm-hmm. the house and our kids are kind of, I don't want to call them square, but they are kind of a little square. They're into other things. But, yes, they <laughs> are. They're into other things. So, But when Beyonce came out on stage, she was just, her eyes were fixated on Beyonce. So I thought that was cool. But um, yeah, I just, you know, for both of my kids, but especially for girls, um, especially with the president that we have now, we really mm-hmm. have to teach them to go after what they want and not be silent. I took her to the Women's March in LA last weekend and I was so happy about it. And I was contemplating about going or not because I don't know, there are a few issues that I had with the march, but at the same time, I did definitely want to be there. And my daughter had a tournament that day and I was thinking about taking her out of the tournament so we could go, but the tournament wound up being canceled. And I was like, okay, this is a sign. We're going, we're going. We took the train. I never take the train. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really great that we went and she got to see that. Um, all of these strong, not only women, but everybody there fighting because, you know, of what this is, this administration thinks of women and what they're doing, you know, to, to women with their policies. And, you know, women includes black women and indigenous women and all of the other issues that we all face and that the intersectionality of what a woman means, uh, what being a woman means in 2016, 2017, and what that means moving forward. So I think all of these things hopefully are making an impact on who she becomes and Mm -hmm. how she thinks and how she views other people and how she views herself. Um, I don't even remember what your question was. But no, that's yeah. excellent. I was talking about seeing. No, that's perfect. I was talking about seeing these things in your daughter or, or paying attention oh, to yeah. what she's drawn to. But this, it actually, what you just spoke about leads me into another question that I had. You recently posted a quote on um, Instagram maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, they tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds, which has been used in different ways to convey strength and resistance mm-hmm. to different movements, yeah. right? But what I was curious about is what are you teaching your daughter, Scarlett, about resistance? especially during, as you mentioned, times like these and all of these different things that are going on facing women, especially women of color? Being um, 
a millennial. I consider myself to be a millennial. I'm an old millennial, <laughs> but I, I consider myself to be a millennial. Being a millennial parent, I think it starts there in her uh, relationship with me and her relationship with, you know, both me and my husband. Um, when I was growing up, my parents are baby boomers, um, and I'm assuming a lot of kids from the 80s and earlier, we were taught, you know, a child stays in a child's place. Mm-hmm. You be quiet when grown folks are talking. Don't be asking no questions. When If I tell you to do something, don't ask me why. Just do it and all that kind of stuff. And I had that way of thinking because that's what I was taught. But when I had her and I realized that she's not just not a pet, but like she's an actual human being with Mm -hmm. feelings and emotions. And I should care about what she thinks. I should care about what she wants. And I should care about things that she doesn't want to do when she was old enough where we started having conversations and discussions. It was a big eye opener for me in showing me that the resistance part of who I want her to be as a grown woman, where she's telling people what she does want and what she doesn't want that it's happening now with me as her mom. Mm -hmm. So if she's telling me she doesn't in a respectful way, of course, but if, if I'm telling her, I want her to do something right. And she's saying, I don't want to do it. And she has a reason for it. I have to take that into consideration. Now it doesn't mean I have to go along with it. Right. Because I am still her parent. But if she's telling me she doesn't want to do something and the reasons why and the reasons make sense and she means what she's saying, part of that resistance means that I have to listen to that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So and, when, and and moving forward, knowing that she's her own person, she's going to not always agree with what I say. She's not a little me. She's her own person. Um you know, I definitely want her to take that with her as she gets older because this girl will, will argue you down. That's, That's good. just kind of who she is and in a, you know, in a respectful way, obviously, but she's witty. She's mm-hmm. smart. You, she, she, you can't get anything past her. And she tells me when I'm wrong, too, which mm-hmm. doesn't make me feel good all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but she does. And she's just I I love the the person that she is and I'm excited to see the person that she the person that she grows into um I think because I'm so I try to be very politically aware Mm -hmm. and politically savvy and even in my learning about black feminism and feminism and intersectionality and all of that online I learned all of this at the what Uh, an older age in my 20s is when I first started getting on social media and stuff but these are lessons that I've already taught her that I'm teaching her now because this is what I'm learning so what I learn I pass it on to her and my son is five but it's going to be the same thing with him as well when he gets older so it's 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 really exciting to see even when we talk about kids nowadays the fact that she was just at a march at nine years old I didn't go to no marches when I was nine years old that was actually my first march that I've ever actually that I've ever been to so I think we're giving these kids the tools that they will need to be able to continue the resistance that's happening now excellent now if you think about your younger self what advice um would you give to your younger self knowing the things that you know now especially as related to your career because you've had a 20-year career in the business which isn't you know something that's um the standard for everyone people come and go so what advice would you give to your younger self save your money which i mean what young person is trying to save their money but i would say save your money and i would say the drive and the uh, feeling that you have about writing, pursue that. Mm. I would say pursue that. Um, I would say stay on your team, your management team, about your scripts and all that. Um, and it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. I had a lot of, a, a lot of self-doubt when I was younger um, because the business can be so heartbreaking really it can be so heartbreaking and how do you survive that I know with auditions and different things you know it is all about 
um, I shouldn't say all about our perception is that it's about going in and performing for someone yeah. for a role and then you either get accepted or rejected to put in the simplest yeah. terms how do yeah. you survive that over so many years and how do you keep surviving it when you're not 22 anymore right um in an industry that wants you to be forever 22 oh for sure for sure um uh, it's it's definitely hard. I will will say that it's so important to have a real life and real family, whatever that family looks like, people who love you regardless of what whatever job you have. Mm-hmm. Because for most of us, most of us are not a list. Most of us are not. Excuse me. Um, you know, Will Smith and whoever else, um, Holly Berry. Most of us are not that. So that means most of us will be at home most of the time there's auditions it's pilot season right now this is my umpteenth pilot season um you just have to know who you are you practice your craft you go in you do your job and then you leave it in the room what i've uh learned having casted for my own projects Mm -hmm. um being a director for my own projects is that you may see many people who are fantastic but you can only pick one And I've taken that with me as an actor as well. Now, you know, whenever I audition for things or whatever, I go in the room, I do my job and I leave it there. Whoever they pick, whoever they decide not to pick, that is their choice. They're looking for a specific person for this role, whatever, whatever, whatever. It has nothing to do with me. Everything that has to do with me, I leave it in the room. And all the decisions that they make, it has absolutely nothing to do with me, which is another reason why I'm so excited about continuing to create my own content Mm -hmm. um, because the acting will always be there for me. I love acting, but I love being able to create stories and write stories as well. So, you know, it is what it is. Don't take it too seriously. It's hard because, you know, you got to pay bills and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you you work it out however you can, however you need to. And don't drive yourself... uh, insane don't drive yourself crazy um uh practice Mm self-care um yeah yeah that I mean that's really all I can say the business is is brutal and I'm saying that as someone who booked a a a a tv a syndicated tv show two months after I got here right so you know even been going in the business for all these years right right and you know um but even with that, the last few pilot seasons, I haven't booked anything. Um, pilot season is happening right now. We'll see what happens. So, so tell folks, you know, for those who don't know, what, is, um, what does pilot season entail? What is that? Pilot season is every year from January to about, I'd say, April um, is when networks have auditions for their possible new TV shows that they will premiere the mm-hmm. following fall. So any new shows that come on in September, October, whatever, they audition for those shows at the beginning of the year. And if you get that job, you will shoot the pilot, which is the first episode of that show. And around May, that's when you'll find out if the network is picking up that show or if the network is saying, "Okay, no, we don't want to pursue this any further. And if you are picked up, then you will see those shows come the fall. Mm hmm. And then it's a whole other thing. If your show does make it to the fall, you have to wait and see if they're going to give you a full season. You know, networks want to see. They're very picky right now. They don't really give shows a chance to develop an audience like they used to. So even if your show does get picked up for the fall, you may get three episodes and the network may call like, okay, y'all not doing what you're supposed to be doing. The ratings suck. Okay, we're canceling you. I know. People always use um, Seinfeld as an example of just the show that was given so much time. There might be others, but I know that's one I hear people talk about what a year or some long amount of time they gave the show to sort of pick up because at first people weren't catching on to it or getting there are so many shows like that you turn on tv like damn this show is still on like you don't know anybody who watches the show whatever but i mean they're 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 different i guess reasons networks give to why they have shows that last or Mm -hmm. why why they take shows off the air or whatever um but that's what pilot season is and even if you do make it past the three and four episodes if you find out you're getting the back nine which is for most um there are half hour or there are uh well this is back in the day we used to get 22 episodes or somewhere around there so Mm -hmm. you would do the first half 
and then you would see if the network gave you the back nine. That means you got a full season, and then after that, you got to see if you're coming back for season two. So it's a it's a never ending waiting and hoping. Working you're and just waiting, always right? waiting and hoping. Like <laughs> working, you know, waiting, and hoping. Then eventually, the show comes to an end, and you got to do it all over again. So that's 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 the business, and that's why it's so important to have a real life and and people who love you no matter you know what you're working on or, or what you're doing you know was there ever a point for you throughout the journey all these years where you felt like um i'm not doing this anymore you know this is too much oh yes after yeah. many a glass of wine to my husband <laughs> oh yes like, this there is have it. been a few there have been a few conversations with me and my husband oh yes i mean it's difficult. I'm not, I, I physically, I may look like I did when I was in my 20s, but mentally, I'm not in that space anymore. I have two kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I was emailing you earlier, I just picked up my son from kindergarten and he had a great day. So I had to talk. I'm talking to his teacher. They had a substitute yesterday. The class did not like the substitute. So I got to come home, do his homework. And, you know, in two hours, I got to take my oldest to the doctor. Like, you know, I, my mind, I just have other shit going on, Right. you know, and mm-hmm. it's not to say that I don't give auditions my all, but it has to be at this point in my life. It has to be. I'm not getting on the freeway if it's a show that I don't believe in or a show that that I don't like. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm and it's not to say that I don't need the money or I'm rich. I'm be I'm not rich at all. I still got to pay my mortgage every month and all that kind of stuff. But it, the place that I am in my life, I'm not just going to be going to three and four and five auditions a day like I used to do when I was 22. That's all I had to do when I was 22. I'm not that. I have other shit I have to do. So that's kind of where I am. And I'm not sure my agent is <laughs> too happy about it. But shit, they work for me. God damn it. Exactly. Like, <laughs> and I feel like that's a meta. What you just said is like a metaphor for life. I'm not getting on the freeway if I don't believe in this. God damn it. No, I'm not. In this California, on the LA traffic, I'm not getting on the freeway exactly. unless I want to. I would love to be on this show or whatever. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm about to use, I might have to put that quote up. I'll give you credit. <laughs> I'm not getting on the freeway unless I believe in this. So let's that's talk, right. Let's talk about one of your most recent roles, uh, which was as Chantal Nova's yes. love interest on and yes. a Black Lives Matter activist on Queen Sugar. Which that's is a right. Great role, and I hope she's coming back. We'll see. I hope so too. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. What would you say though is your ideal role at this stage? As you mentioned, you're in a different space overall yeah. so what would you what kind of role would you be excited about these days oh my gosh it would it would have to be if it's not something that I create for myself because mm-hmm. that's number one I would love to do that it, but if it's not that right now in this moment uh, Queen Latifah was talking I'm gonna go ahead and put this out in the universe mm-hmm. So Queen Latifah, I read an article where she's thinking about bringing Living Single back. Mm. I'm like, I would love to be on a show like that, a show like Blackish, a show like Insecure, a show like Queen Sugar. I feel like I would love to be on a show that's socially aware right. of what's happening. I would love to be on a show that, even if it's not a quote unquote black show or centers blackness which would be number one for me I would love to do that but at least is socially aware of the things that marginalized people are going through um just a socially aware kind of show and I love to be funny you know I I I I think I'm funny you are funny. <laughs> uh, you know I, I love comedies I love dramas as well um I just don't want to be on a show that's about nothing, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And there's a place for those shows, too. There's totally a place for, for those shows. Um, but I, I, I want to be on a show that means something mm-hmm. and that's standing for something, if that makes sense. Even if it's in a goofy-ass way or whatever. 
that's kind of where I am right now. No, it totally makes sense. And I think the shows that you mentioned, for example, Blackish is not a drama. Obviously, it's a comedy. Right. But they, I think they are one of the, the few that do so well in addressing current issues. They're and things. so good. And so the writing is so good. And then Issa Rae in her own way, you know, just telling yeah. the black woman's story. So I think totally and Queen Sugar, of course, what you mentioned. Yeah. Those are good examples of that. But as you've also mentioned, you, you are always, you have always, at least since I've known you, struck out on your own, created your own work, work Work, quote unquote outside of the system and you yeah. have your own web series surviving which is amazing mm -hmm. and thank uh, you yeah and your own podcast too Reaganomics which I listen to right. some episodes of that so why is um creating your own work very important to you as a priority especially at this stage well these are things that I didn't even know that I wanted to do and when we talked your question earlier about when I what, what at what point did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. Uh, I think I started, uh, I, I've, I've always been a writer. I've, I've written for, since I was a teenager, but when it comes to content creation, I had, um, written scripts for, uh, film and TV and I had meetings and all that kind of stuff. The things that you're supposed to do when you're, you know, a writer or whatever. But I feel like I came around at, at the right time when YouTube was, was up and running and, you know, uh, black web series were kind of becoming a thing and social media was around. So I feel like I had all of the right ingredients to be able to help me to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I got on Twitter in 2009, not even thinking about, oh, well, a few years from now, there'll be, you know, crowdfunding and you'll be able to raise money. Oh, no, did you know that black web series are becoming a thing on YouTube? And, you know, I, I, did, I didn't even start... Uh, Twitter thinking about that stuff, but it seems like everything kind of happened at the same time. Um, and talking to other black content creators on Twitter and seeing how we're all kind of in the same struggle and the same place where it's like, okay, we don't see ourselves on TV. We don't see ourselves in movies. What the fuck are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. um, and then crowdfunding became a thing and it's like, oh, here's a way where you can raise money. So, I feel like all that kind of stuff happened at the same time, and that's why I've been able to uh, do web series like, you know, two seasons of Almost Home and a season of Surviving and, you know, my podcast. And because we had Barack Obama, I mean, I, I, I was hired as a surrogate for Obama in 2011 because of me tweeting about him and the election and all that. And so, you know, all of these things happening together, I, I don't see how anybody who's even a little bit aware can't be, I don't know, motivated to at least have opinions on things that are mm -hmm. happening and, you know, right or wrong. I mean, these last 10 years, so much has happened with social media with, you know, we got computers in our hands, our phones, our goddamn, I'm talking to you, I don't even know how Skype fucking works. I'm talking <laughs> right. to you right now on my fucking phone. Right. Like in the middle, you know, I'm sitting outside. Like, right. we had Obama, now we have Trump. We have, but we also have, you know, all of these amazing TV shows that we just said. We have Oscar So White is a thing. And now, you know, we have all these amazing nominees for this year's Oscars, which is not, all these things are connected. So I... I feel like this is the perfect time for uh, black women and, and marginalized women to be creating content. To put their that's voices what, out there. That's what feminism is right now. Mm -hmm. We are what we are the face of feminism, in my in my opinion. Mm, that's powerful. I think yeah. um, I think to your point, you have we have to have opinions or we all do have opinions, but it's expressing it, which is something that you are definitely great at, especially on Twitter. But in so oh, many thanks. spaces, uh, definitely in so many spaces, but also being uh, courageous enough because it's not that you're fearless being courageous enough to say I'm going to create my own podcast I'm going to create my own series I'm going to try it I'm going to raise money and those kind of things I think that's yeah. sometimes the thing that holds some of us back is not taking it that next step out of whatever kind of fear but as you said there yeah. are so many resources out that there now that we can tap into yeah, for sure for I, sure I think even that with the tools that you mentioned you know Twitter and all of those things you were you weren't getting on it with the intention of doing all these things that you've done. You were oh, no. focused on getting your voice out there in other ways. 
Yeah, like I said, when I got on Twitter, it was just like, okay, I didn't have, <clears throat> I had, my daughter was two, and I didn't have the time to check my goddamn MySpace page right. anymore, <laughs> or whatever the hell I used to have to do with that, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to be on MySpace no more, what am I going to do, what is this Twitter thing that's happening, mm-hmm. so I got on, and I just fell in love with it, I, I, I fell in love with it. And it's so funny because none of my family is on Twitter. Everybody's on Instagram. But out of all of them, I was the first one on Instagram too. So they be trying to tell me, you know, Twitter's this, this, and that, and, and Instagram is this, this, and that. I'm like, listen, I've been on all of this before any of you guys. I was so there I, before I, you got there. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, um, but everybody knows they can find me on Twitter. That's where I live. I like Snapchat a lot as well. Um, but I just, I, I love Twitter. Mm-hmm. It's a bit more, I'd say, since maybe the 2012 election, it's been, as far as the trolls go and the racism and all that, um, everything that, you know, was stopping Twitter from being sold to this company and that company because they're saying the harassment is so bad. It is, and it's especially bad for black women and marginalized women. So, mm-hmm. That's kind of, I don't know. Some days I just have to log off, but I, 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 I love Twitter. And the only good thing I would say about the Trump presidency is that he's on Twitter so much, so I know Twitter's not going anywhere. Right, exactly. That's the, exactly. Only, the only good thing, which probably isn't a good thing. But, I mean, I, I really do love Twitter. I love it more and more every day. Um, that's where I'll be at yeah and and so everyone listening I'll I'll make sure I have a link to it of course but Reagan Gomez on Twitter (laughs) is where you can find her she does amazing tweets and I think there it's so good for the uh, unlike other platforms excuse me there's information if you weed out all the craziness you can find so much information and resources there from people that you trust and follow Um, oh for sure and as you mentioned in 2011 I think you said you were um, an ambassador for President Obama at the time no, I wasn't an ambassador. ambassador. I wasn't that but fancy. No. Just, yeah, like that surrogate. <laughs> surrogate. There you go. Well, yeah. President Obama. But, um, and you've always, you know, talked about politics even before then on Twitter. Has that affected your career at all? I'm curious. I don't know. I wonder about that all the time because I go on Twitter with these rants. and mm-hmm. Well, they're not rants, but I, I'm very free uh with what I say on Twitter and I I feel like I was lucky to get on Twitter when I was on the Cleveland show Mm -hmm. because the Cleveland show is so um politically well just the whole Seth MacFarlane world is so politically incorrect that nobody was really caring what I was tweeting about Mm -hmm. so I might have been different if I was the star of like this brand new or if I was Olivia Pope or somebody and you know the Mm -hmm. star of some new show that a network is depending on it might have been different I don't know but I'm just grateful that I got on Twitter at a time when I wasn't on anything I guess I don't know major and so I don't know I don't know if it's affected my career I know it's definitely helped me personally especially as far as my entrepreneurial ship and um you know being in contact with my fans and um being able to do my own projects and even, you know, surviving was nominated for a Gotham award. I know that's um, major. Last year. Which, thank you so much. And even being in contact with other content creators, like, um, I, uh, you know, talked to so many women that I know from the business and so many women who, you know, I met Issa, we- Issa Rae through Twitter and mm-hmm. Ava DuVernay. I met her through Twitter and so many amazing women like that, that, you know, you, you meet years and years ago because we're talking about the same things or whatever and watching all these people kind of blossom and become who they are and I'm doing the same. And it's um, it's definitely been food for my soul, if mm-hmm. it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes you can feel like, especially in this business, you can feel like, oh, you're alone. Nobody really knows what you're going through, um, especially as black women, because I feel like even... We're kind of in the forefront now, um, but it hasn't always been that. When people talk about black, they're always talking about black men. And I feel like black women are always kind of forgotten about. Um, Mm -hmm. But there's such a nice kinship and there's such a nice um, group of black women on Twitter and on the tumblers and and all that. And you kind of you need that, especially when it comes to working and you know, creating and and dealing with the business or whatever career you're going through um, or you're dealing with. Um, 
So it's definitely helped me in in that way. Um, so yeah. No, that's excellent. And I think it's um it's important. I always tell people, you know, find your people, which isn't even just oh, by sure. color. Find your tribe, yeah. Exactly. Build your tribe, yep. whatever that looks yep. like. Because as you said, no matter what you're going through, it's good to have some people around you to support support is sexy. That's what we talk that's about right. here, right? That's right. So that's let right. me ask you, do you have any political aspirations? You know what? Uh oh. I don't know. Twenty twenty. Oh girl. <laughs> uh, I could I couldn't cause see, I don't know how people do it because cause, cause I don't know how you could do it without going upside somebody's head right. with a fist or I just don't know. I just don't know how these people I don't and the way the media and the news is set up now, they'll have someone they'll have people arguing about racism or arguing about Black Lives Matter. One person will be pro Black Lives Matter, the mm-hmm. other person will be against. But there's certain things that there's not there's not more than one opinion on this. So I, I just don't I, I, I don't I don't get it. But as far as politics, I don't know, because I got to tell you, even just tweeting through 2012, which how naive I was, I thought that this election was going to be boring. I thought it was I wasn't going to be interested in it. And I, I, I'm so exhausted. I'm so tired. Mm-hmm. I'm so drained. I'm so it's not that I'm not hopeful, but I'm just kind of over it. And I'm just like, it's the exact opposite of how I felt in 2012. Like, it's the total and exact opposite. And it's it's draining. It's, it's exhausting. Draining. It's like, you got to tell your kids why this happened. But mama, you said more people liked her than him. I'm sorry, mama was wrong. Okay? Right. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Can't right? explain it. That's what I have friends who were saying. Their kids were literally crying and they were trying to figure out what to tell them. But there really is no explanation other than there is the electoral no college. Yeah. So, I don't, you know, it's just very exhausting and it's very draining. But at the same time, I can't seem to look away. I can't see as much as I want to kind of tap out. I can't seem to or I I don't know. I, I still want to. It's like what my husband told me, like, <clears throat> I think that a day or two or a week after the election, um, I told him I'm not even listening to the news no more because all they're going to be doing is fucking talking about him. I don't know if you can cuss on this podcast, yeah, but fine. all they're going to be doing is talking about him. And he's like, no, you still need to be aware. You really need to be aware of what's going on right now. And I'm like, God, you're right. Oh, my God. It just it's just not fun mm-hmm. anymore. But I guess politics, it's fun sometimes, but there's a lot of serious shit happening so it shouldn't be i don't know it's not a game it goes exactly it goes in cycles i think um to your point i felt the same way you sort of have these moments where i literally had to be like i can't watch anymore it was making me ill but it's funny because now it's a time as your husband said where instead of tapping out we sort of have to lean in but i will say it's important i think more than ever for us to take care of ourselves oh yes so i will ask you yeah what are you doing to especially because you're so involved and then in an industry (laughs) outside of politics that can yeah do you know not be uh always nurturing so what are the ways that you take care of yourself with my family um i'm really trying to figure it out to be quite honest with you i was at the gym and you know the tvs are on and he gave some kind of speech this morning so it's not like you can get away from him or what's happening I'm, I'm honestly I'm really trying to figure it out I'm trying to find that balance because what I have been doing has not been working um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um I, I I don't know I because even being on Twitter too every day I'm retweeting 10 12 15 different tweets about how Trump has destroyed something else or he's breaking the constitution in some other kind of way every day. I mean, it's only been not even a week. It seems like Saturday was so long ago or Friday, whenever he was in, it seems like even the March, it seems like forever ago. And it hasn't even been a week. Cause time, it's like and I how, think overall too, time just moves so much faster now. And then with all this coming, it just feels like a wave of stuff. And it just seems like he's literally destroying the world 10 times over every single day in a new way. 10 different new ways than yesterday. So you forget about yesterday or Monday or Wednesday or what's today? I don't even know what what day it is today, but Thursday. (laughs) Okay. But it's always something new. So I'm really, I have, I I need to figure out how I'm going to do this for four years because it's already been a week and I'm, 
I'm exhausted. I don't, I don't mentally, and I know this isn't good for me. And if it's not good for me, I know it's not good for a lot of people. So I'm really, I have to figure this out and I haven't done it yet, but I need to, I need to figure it out. Did you, have a, did you, you must, did you have a, um, a self care practice before, you know, the election, everything started? How do you do I it? I didn't No, I didn't because mm. I didn't really feel like I needed one except for, I mean, outside of politics, just in general. Yeah. That's what I, I didn't, I didn't really, cause I never, okay. So as far as like relaxation and all that, anytime the kids go to Nana's house, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Me and my husband were, we don't have nannies or anything. So the two of us are running from work to picking the kids up to soccer practice to, to all that kind of stuff. So anytime we can get away and get a date night or go away somewhere, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a hair and nails kind of person. Cause I'm always like, I could be doing other shit, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I'm trying to force myself to go get facials. I just, I, I don't like sitting still and I need to change that I don't like sitting still um so but now with this new administration I, I have to force myself into self-care that's that's was one of my new year's uh, resolutions so okay I'm trying to get better I'm trying to get better I'm gonna keep checking on you okay please do <laughs> <laughs> so in closing if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally who would that be and what would you say? Oh, gosh. Um, I would say, <clears throat> let's see, there's so many people. It's a tie between my mother and my husband. And I would have to say my husband. I've been with my husband since I was 15, since I was 16, 15 and 16. We've been together. We were married at 18 and 19. Mm. Um and we have grown together and we didn't have our kids until we were in our mid to late. We were married at 18, 19. I didn't have a Scarlet at first till I was 27. So we had a lot of time just to ourselves and growing um, as a couple. And we've really been able to grow together and now we work together and he does things on his own as well, just like I still do. But I would say it's him because this is my team. This is my foundation. This is my him. And, and now my children are, are my home base. They are my support. They are my uh, everything. When I come home and I, you know, there's an audition that I really wanted and I go in and I suck and I come home. They're like, OK, mom, that's that's horrible. But what movie are we watching tonight? What are we eating for dinner? You know, you want to sit down? Can we have some cookies? And they just kind of take my mind off of everything and, and put things in perspective um, for me. And they also motivate me. Mm -hmm. They they motivate me. They make me want to be a better person, a better human being, a better a better everything. So I would have to say my, my husband, and he's a really great guy and he's cute and, <laughs> you know, he's funny. He makes me laugh. He's a good dad. And yeah, it would be my husband for sure. That's beautiful. I love how you guys sort of grew up together and yeah. now are growing this family together. That's something yeah. that you don't see a lot in Hollywood too. Yeah. Excellent. So tell us how we can support you. Tell everybody websites to go to, <coughs> social media. Of course, I'll have links to everything. But what can we do right now to support you? Sure. Well, my website, I'm in the middle of uh, upgrading it right now. It's ReaganGomez.com. It's Reagan Gomez everywhere, really. Mm -hmm. But I'm in the middle of uh, updating it right now. But you guys can check out my podcast, uh, Reaganomics, mm -hmm. on um, iTunes and SoundCloud. And you can check out uh, all of our content on YouTube, our first two seasons of uh, Almost Home and our first season of Surviving. Um, I believe there is a donation link on YouTube as well, and you can donate to help us continue to create our content and you can you guys can follow me reagan gomez on twitter and instagram and snapchat excellent reagan thank you so much i think you and i met through twitter so i'm so glad to yes. chat with you again <laughs> i chat with you years ago and i'm just yes. happy to see you continue to create the things that you're doing and the reason i wanted to talk to you just because i think you know you're one of those people who is a voice for so many of us but you're creating your own work and getting our stories and things out there in so many different ways so thank you for all that you're thank doing thank you so much for having me absolutely and before you go what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything trust your gut go with your gut believe in yourself um and we we have that 
I don't know if it's just a woman thing, but this is what I've been told, that that women's intuition, it's there for a reason. Trust it. Don't let people gaslight you or try to fake you out or trick you out of what you're thinking of or what you know is right. Trust your gut. Excellent. Trust your gut. Mm-hmm. Ready to go, That's Ms. right. Thank you. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that interview with Reagan Gomez. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, you can go to supportissexypodcast.com to see links to all of the resources, people, actors, television shows, all of the great things that Reagan mentioned in this episode. Also, please be sure to go to supportissexylove.com. That's supportissexylove.com. So you can check out our I Fund Women campaign. We are raising money to keep doing the Support is Sexy podcast five days a week at the level of excellence that you deserve interviewing other inspiring women entrepreneurs just like reagan who share their journeys their stories their wins their lessons their resources their experiences all there to inspire you to take your career your business and your life to the next level so check us out and check out the rewards that i'm offering really great fun stuff that i'm sure you'll enjoy support is sexy love.com we could really use your support no amount is too little everything is appreciated donate share would love your support support is sexy love.com all right thank you as always for listening and now you know what to do go out there and create something sexy and i'll talk to you soon take care